What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And today's video is the second part of a two part video in which I reveal, go through, break down my 2022 rookie running back rankings before the NFL draft happens. This is ranked based on just how good do I think these players are. I'm not making assumptions about draft capital, shit like that. This is just in what order do I think the talent level of these guys uh, shakes out. First video, I kind of went through, I think, RB42 through RB14. And so this video will be RB13 through RB1. So the guys that I'm like legitimately interested in, um, guys who I think are the best, like pure talents in this class. So yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> First off, my RB13 is Bryant Kobach out of Toledo. And um, kind of the same way I did in that first video, I'm going to give you a couple numbers um, that kind of are key, like elements of these guys' profiles, and then two comps representing sort of like their range of outcomes. Um, some of the comps are like, give these guys a pretty tight range of outcomes. Some of them are pretty wide, you know, have kind of boom bust profiles. So kind of anchor our evaluations, like my thoughts on them with those things. And the first number um, to keep in mind for Bryant Kobach is 9.71, which was his RAS score. Kentley Platt, um, at MathBomb on Twitter, probably heard of him, has the relative athletic score system. It kind of normalizes athletic testing data and, you know, for the size of players and for the position they play on a 0 to 10 scale. And so Bryant Kobach scored a 9.71 in that system. So he's very athletic. He ran 4.49 in the 40-yard dash, 92nd percentile burst score, 54th percentile agility score, and he's not a big dude, but he's not super small. He's 209 pounds, so, you know, right around like J.K. Dobbins size, really, and he was able to convert that athleticism into efficient play at Toledo. His box-adjusted efficiency rating, which looks at how he's, <laughs> I explain this in every video, but it looks at like how efficient is he relative to the other guys operating on the same team in the same offensive environment that he is, given the box counts that he's seeing. And so, you know, there's a certain amount of yards available in his offense. What is he doing above and beyond what other players on the team are getting? His box adjusted efficiency rating is in the 72nd percentile for his final season. So he was, you know, a really efficient player. And the second number to keep in mind for him is 13.7%, which is his target share. 85th percentile, he cut 66 receptions in college on a 1.2 A dot, which is upper percentiles in the 70th percentile, and 7.7 .7 yards per target in the 71st percentile. So he's a 209 pound dude who's athletic, who is an efficient runner in college, and who catches passes. I think he's a three down back, but the third Third number I want to keep in mind for him is negative 4.2%, and that's his relative success rate. So where box adjusted efficiency rating looks at overall how efficient are you on a per touch basis relative to your teammates, given the box counts you're seeing. Relative success rate modifies your kind of per carry output in the same way. But instead of looking at an average, it looks at how often are you succeeding on your carries given down in distance. And so if it's like third and eight and you run for six yards, you know, six yards per carry is pretty good, but you didn't like succeed on that carry. So those kind of players look bad on relative success rate. And so his relative success rate is 4% lower than the other guys at Toledo, which is in the 14th percentile. And given like his high overall efficiency next to his like play to play consistency, which is low. He's a very like volatile runner. He's a boom bust guy on a per touch, on a per touch basis. And given that he's like a really good athlete and is converting that into efficient play overall, I think he's pretty unrefined. Like I, you know, I'm not really a film guy, but I don't know if he has good vision or is just like not making good decisions at the line of scrimmage. Maybe he's not very patient. Maybe he's too patient. I don't know what those things are, but for whatever reason, he's not succeeding to an impressive level at all on his carries, but on the carries he is succeeding on, he's converting them into, you know, splash plays, long runs, good overall efficiency. And so he's got that boom bust quality to him. And the comps that I have for him on the high end is Maurice Jones Drew, you know, an undersized guy. Um, who was built well and was athletic, could catch passes, really dynamic in the open field. Maurice Jones-Drew was a good runner. Jeremy McNichols, also, you know, kind of an average size back, a little bit bigger than these guys, but super athletic, super efficient in college, caught a lot of passes, but just like Bryant Kobach, had these issues with, you know, consistency on a down-to-down -down basis and hasn't been able to convert his, like, college success 
into effective play in the NFL. So that's kind of the risk with Bryant Kobach. He's an efficient player, has been an effective player, good three down player, but the risk is that he's just kind of so raw that he's not going to be able to do it in the NFL. My RB12 in this class is Letty Brown, and he's kind of the straight opposite of Bryant Kobach. Um, the first number to keep in mind for him is two, and that's two straight seasons for him with dominator ratings above 30%. And other than him, only Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker in this class are guys who've done that at Power 5 programs. It's Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, and Letty Brown, the only three guys with two consecutive seasons of like really upper percentile production at like legitimate programs in legitimate conferences. So he's been successful as a producer, you know, at West Virginia. The second number to keep in mind for him is 5.9%, and that's his relative success rate. So where Bryant Kobach was like lagging behind his teammates significantly, Letty Brown was much better than them at like, you know, navigating the line of scrimmage, making good decisions, um, identifying holes, and succeeding on his carries on a consistent basis. That relative success rate is in the 80th percentile, but it's contrasted with a 41st percentile box adjusted efficiency rating. And so, you know, like Bryant Kobach, I'll use him as, you know, kind of the, the opposite again, is creating these big plays and being efficient overall while not showing consistency play to play. Letty Brown's the opposite. He's not extending plays, you know, extending runs deep into the secondary. His breakaway conversion rate, which looks at how often is he converting his 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs. Like, what is he doing in the open field? Just 14th percentile. He doesn't break many tackles. 37th percentile missed tackles forced per attempt. I don't think he's a very, like, dynamic runner, but I do think he's, like, a good instinctual runner who's going to like maximize what is blocked without offering a bunch on top of that. And then the third number to keep in mind for Letty Brown is 86 receptions. That's his career number. He's been a, a good three down back as well. Um, I don't think he's especially dynamic in the passing game, but I think he's really solid. And that's really just what Letty Brown is. He's solid. 86 receptions among guys in this class who weigh at least 210 pounds and played at the FBS level. So like ignoring Julius Chestnut is basically what we're doing here. And Pierre Strong and dudes like that. Letty Brown is second behind Keontae Ingram in like workhorse sized runners at FBS schools in pass catching. Like he's been a prolific pass catcher, good size at a decent program. And the comps for him I have are Dari Agunbawale and LaMichael P. Ryan, who like those names aren't very exciting, but like LaMichael P. Ryan gets work in the NFL. Dari Agunbawale has been a solid role player. I don't think the range of outcomes for Letty Brown is very like wide. There's not like, you know, a super high end for him there. But I think he's very capable of being like a solid NFL contributor and maybe not like a good fantasy guy, maybe not a guy I'm looking out for to make a big impact on my fantasy team. But I think the odds that he just like latches on with the team and is solid are really high. So my RB11 is Zamir White out of Georgia. Um, the first number to keep in mind for him is 4.22, which is the collective like average star rating that his teammates had as high school recruits. That's 91st percentile. In this class, it's third behind only Brian Robinson, who played at Alabama with a bunch of talented dudes, and James Cook, who obviously played with Zamir White at Georgia. So really talented teammates, which is why Zamir White, the highest carry total he had in a given season was 160. And so he's sharing the field with a lot of other talented running backs. His production's been pretty subdued as a result. His highest dominator rating, 24.5% in 2020. That's a 54th percentile number. He just hasn't gotten a lot of work because he's playing, because he's sharing the field with a lot of other talented dudes. The second key number for him is 4-4, four, four, and that's what he ran in the 40, 4-4 four, four flat, gives him a 95th percentile speed score, and Cody Carpentier at Roto Underworld um, shared on, uh, I believe, the, the Sonic Truth podcast uh, like a week ago that he's talked to some like NFL personnel guys or former NFL personnel guys, and they've said that they, you know, love Zamir White's like big playability. He said that they're like, you know, even more than like Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker, Zamir White is the guy that personnel, you know, NFL personnel guys look at and see this guy could score on any play. Like he, you know, makes their, their heart stop just like seeing what he's about to do on, on these carries, given his like big play ability that he gets from his speed. The third number to keep in mind from him though, is that take about Zamir White's like on field, you know, dynamism, big playability. It's just not true. Like he's fast, but he hasn't shown to be a big play guy on the field during his time at Georgia. His breakaway conversion rate, so like how often is he turning these chunk runs into breakaways deep down the field? Just 25%, which is in the 25th percentile. So he's not impressive at all as like a big play open field runner. And his overall efficiency relative to the other guys at Georgia, like they're a talented group, 
but he's he's only produced a 98.6% box adjusted efficiency rating, which is in the 14th percentile. He's been incredibly inefficient relative to his teammates, albeit talented teammates, but still not impressive relative to those guys. And even just like reaching the open field, his 10 yard run rate is almost a percent lower than theirs, which is in the 31st percentile. And the thing with him is, you know, like Letty Brown, he's not creating these, these big plays, but on like a play to play basis, he is consistently churning out positive yardage, 70 first percentile in relative success rate. So this kind of, you know, reputation that Zamir White seems to have as like 4-4 four, four dude, like Adrian Peterson type guy who can just like rip off these long runs, like make it into the secondary and then he's gone. It, that's just, it's false. Like he hasn't done that. And, you know, hypothetically, it seems like he could do that given his speed, but he doesn't reach the secondary more often than the other guys in the same offense. And he doesn't do good things once he's in the open field. So kind of a paradoxical like skill set match with what he's actually doing on the field. And because of that, the comps I have for him are Nick Chubb, which is like incredibly high end. If he's Nick Chubb, I think that's pretty unlikely, but you know, hypothetically he could get there, I guess, given the speed, given the size, things like that. If he's able to transfer this 4-4 speed into big play impact in the NFL where he hasn't done that in college, I guess he could be like a poor man's Nick Chubb. The low end of that is Raquel Armstead, who's a similar like size speed guy, was also efficient in college. Raquel Armstead has been good on limited work in the NFL, at least, you know, the last time we saw him. I think Zamir White's floor is like Raquel Armstead. He'll like hang around on a team and be at least that good. I think the truth for him lies somewhere in the middle. My RB10 in this class is Zaquandre White out of South Carolina. One of the weirdest running backs in this class, and the first number to keep in mind for him is 37.6%, which is his dominator rating as a junior at Iowa Western Community College. So he started his career at, I believe, Florida State, um, was recruited as like a four-star running back. They had him playing linebacker early on after a redshirt year. He said, fuck that, transferred to Iowa Western, and was dominant. Like 38% dominator rating is really good. And obviously that's community college, but if we look at guys from the past who also played at community college, like Rashad White in this class, Alvin Kamara had a season there, Chris Carson, Antonio Gibson played at community college. The dominator rating that Zaquandre White posted at community college is higher than the best dominator ratings posted by all of those guys at community college. So yeah, low level of competition, but given what we've seen successful backs do at that level before, Zaquandre White is right there with him and better than a lot of them. The second number to keep in mind for him is 0.30, which is the missed tackles force per attempt number for Zaquandre White at South Carolina. That's in the 91st percentile. Like, I, I said this in a video like a couple months ago. This the, the dude is like drunk Alvin Kamara running the ball. He's just like falling over himself, contorting his body in weird ways, trying to jump over people. He's a fucking weird runner, but it, it like creates situations where like he's breaking tackles and it kind of works for him. And he's able to leverage that into really good play in the open field. 46.7% breakaway conversion rate. He's converting almost half of his 10-yard runs into runs of 20 yards or more. That's a 97th percentile mark. And those, you know, box adjusted efficiency and relative success rate, like efficiency overall, play to play consistency, 63rd percentile, 61st percentile. So he's, he's a weird runner, but it's been effective for him in the SEC. The third number to keep in mind for Zaquandre White is 85%. And that is the self-reported level of health that he had when he tested at his pro day. He's kind of been dealing with an, with an ankle injury this, this off-season cycle. He didn't run at the combine. He ended up doing it at, at his pro day, said he wasn't quite healthy. And on that ankle, he posted a 4.15 relative athletic score. He was 4.63 in the 40. He was explosive with 68th percentile burst score, only 12th percentile agility, which is very strange. Like, you know, it, it's hard to trust a guy who's like, I was only 85% healthy. Like, that's why I wasn't very good. It's like, okay, like, fuck you. Like, you're probably just not ath athletic. But we've seen Zaquandre White, like his high school testing numbers, he ran 4.51 in the 40. He had a 43 and a half inch vert as a high schooler. 4.42 in the shuttle, which isn't impressive for an NFL guy. It's like 51st percentile for NFL players. But like, as an 18 year old high school kid, that's pretty damn good. And so... You know, we saw him be really athletic, you know, as a young guy, come to his pro day, not be very impressive other than still being explosive in the jumps. And it's like, okay, what do we really do with this? And I don't really know. Like, we can't just ignore what he did and say, okay, but he, he's got a 43-inch vert and he runs a 4.5. Like, that's not really a, a sound process. But given that self-reported he was dealing with an injury... 
We have verified athletic testing data from back when he was in high school. I think it's safe to say that he's at least a better athlete than what he showed at his pro day. And another thing that kind of like muddies up his evaluation is he only has 125 touches at the FBS level. Like he was productive at community college, shared time with Kevin Harris this last year at South Carolina, just doesn't have a lot to go off of. He was really good in a limited sample. It's just tough to draw strong conclusions. And his floor is very low. Ryan Williams is the floor comp I have for him, who is a stud at Virginia Tech, got hurt in the NFL, just never quite put it together. The bottom of the barrel is like the floor for Zaquandre White, but the ceiling is Alvin Kamara. That's a very lofty goal to reach, and it's unlikely he gets there, obviously, but from an efficiency standpoint, from a tackle-breaking standpoint, from a three-down back standpoint, like he was very involved as a receiver given his small overall role. He's explosive just like Kamara is. Similar body types, you know, Zaquandre's a little bit smaller, but, you know, similar like lanky dudes. That's the ceiling comp for him. I'm not projecting him to reach that, but somewhere in between Alvin Kamara and Ryan Williams, I would not be surprised to see Zaquandre. Quandre White be like a legitimately good NFL player who contributes in an offense as a three down guy. My RB9 in this class is James Cook out of Georgia. The first number to keep in mind for him is 90.5%, which was his catch rate in college, 94th percentile, very impressive, and especially impressive when you when you consider how dynamically he was being used, how like the degree of difficulty, how high that was on his targets. He was being moved out of the backfield and split out wider in the slot almost 28% of the time. That's also in the 94th percentile. And he was being targeted 1.1 yards on average downfield. That's a 68th percentile A dot. So difficult passes. He's not just catching things like swing passes, screens behind the line of scrimmage. He's being lined up as a wide receiver, as a slot guy, being targeted downfield and still catching the ball at a higher rate than the vast majority of running backs. The second number for him is 39.5% breakaway conversion rate. That's in the 85th percentile. He's incredibly dynamic in the open field. He's fast. What do you run? Like a 4-4-2. His 10-yard run rate, almost 4% higher than the other guys at Georgia. 77th percentile. So he's reaching the open field at a high rate. He's performing well once he's there. And he's leveraged those things into a 116.6% box-adjusted efficiency rating, which is in the 51st percentile. The third number to keep Keep in mind for him is negative 0.18, which is the relative box count that he saw. How many defenders in the box is he seeing on average relative to the other guys at Georgia? The box counts he's seeing are significantly lower. That's 12th percentile. And that's like a, a good and a bad thing. It's good that he has this pass catching ability and is therefore on the field in situations that are conducive to efficiency. You know, we, we don't want our running backs to like hammer their heads into heavy boxes every play. And James Cook is not that dude, but his relative success rate is negative 4% in the 21st percentile. He's not, you know, a three down back who's going to, you know, he's a small guy, obviously. And we're always looking for like the next Austin Eckler. Who's the next Christian McCaffrey? And in order to be that guy, you need to be a three down back who can, you know, run into heavy boxes and handle a large workload. And given that James Cook has really only been successful against light boxes, I don't think he's a guy who's going to step into a role like Austin Eckler and be successful as a three down back. James Cook was better than the other guys at Georgia from an efficiency standpoint against every single box count except for eight and nine man boxes. So against the heaviest boxes. And if you look at a guy like Austin Eckler in the NFL, he's been good in short yardage. He's been good relative to, to the other Chargers running backs in nearly every situation against every box count, even short yardage situations, and even in heavy box counts. So James Cook, I don't think has that element to his game. He's dynamic out in space. I think he's probably the best pass catcher among all the running backs in this class. Ceiling comp for him is Chris Thompson, another super dynamic guy who was productive in fantasy for a while as like a Swiss army knife, satellite back type. Floor comp for him is Joe McKnight, dude out of Reggie Bush, like what, 15 years ago at this point, who similarly dynamic, just kind of never quite put it together in the NFL. This next tier of guys starting at my RB8 is guys who are flawed, but like legitimately exciting. The, these backs that I just talked about are guys who are also flawed and like somewhat exciting, but this next group is just like, I, I could legitimately see these guys being like RB1s, RB2s in fantasy, not just like situational role players. And the first of those guys at my RB8 is Julius Chestnut um, out of Sacred Heart at the FCS level. The first number to keep in mind for him is 60.1%. That was his dominator rating in 2020 as a junior. It's the highest dominator rating in my entire database for a single season. That was a COVID year. I believe it was a spring season for the FCS guys. Five game schedule, so, you know, not an entire season, but he was the centerpiece of his team's offense that year. And the year before, 46% dominator rating. 
Last year, he played hurt, but had a 31% dominator rating. He's not just a one-year wonder. He's been consistently dominant for three straight years now, and he's not just productive. He's been efficient. The second number to keep in mind for him is 2.2, which is his yards per carry relative to the other guys on the team. He's outdone them by more than two yards per carry, which is in the 95th percentile. And yes, he played at Sacred Heart at the FCS level. Not a strong conference, not strong level of competition, not a very big program, but... That's a higher, like, team relative yards per carry than Austin Eckler had, than David Johnson had, than Danny Woodhead had, than James Robinson had, all at the non-FBS level, all at small schools, and Julius Chestnut is 5'11", 228. There were initial reports out of his pro day, um, I think he participated at the UConn pro day, that he ran 4'4", 7 in the 40-yard dash. The verified numbers that I'm seeing now are 4'6", but... You know, whether he's 4.47 or 4.62, like James Robinson was a 4.6 guy, we've seen guys like that succeed before. That's requisite, you know, speed for an NFL running back, especially at that size. If he's 4.47, that's freaky fast for 2.28. 4.62 is still pretty good. And the third number to keep in mind for him is 18 votes, which is what Sacred Heart had in the FCS Top 25 Coaches Poll for last season. They were in the others receiving votes category. The level of competition was just very low. They weren't even a particularly good team. They, they won their conference, but weren't quite a top 25 team at the FCS level. It's hard to trust that he's like an elite player, given that the level of competition is so low. But the upside represented by his production, by his size, by his athleticism, by his efficiency is so much that I'm willing to move him up to RB8 and take chances on him in like every single fourth round of every single rookie draft. There's no reason to leave your rookie draft without this dude. His upside is Rashad Penny. His downside is like Alex Green, um, you know, size speed guy from Hawaii a couple years ago who didn't, you know, end up doing much. But Julius Chestnut could be the next James Robinson. I think he's as likely to do that as any small school guy we've seen come out in recent years. So my RB7 is a guy who I've recently kind of bought into a little bit more is Tyler Algier out of BYU. And the first number to keep in mind for him is 166.5%. That's his career box adjusted efficiency rating, which is in the 97th percentile. He was just absolutely incredible on the ground relative to the, to the other dudes at BYU. Breakaway conversion rate in the 73rd percentile. He's also a tackle breaker, 88th percentile, missed tackles forced per attempt. And he wasn't just a big play guy. Second number for him, 9.6% relative success rate, 91st percentile. So he's been consistent in navigating the line of scrimmage on a play to play basis relative to the other guys on his team. He's been incredibly efficient relative to the, to the other guys on his team. He's been really good in the open field and he breaks tackles. I think he has this reputation as like, you know, we wanted him to be fast at the combine. He only ran four six. And so like he was a big play runner. Can he really translate that to the NFL? I kind of had that impression early on as well, but I think I'm now bought in given this relative success rate number that he's just a legitimate, like, pure runner. This dude is good. And, you know, I originally had him behind Julius Chestnut, and I moved him up because he's been so efficient. How can I justify a similar player? You know, they're both, like, 220 pounds. They both probably run around 4'6". They were both two yards per carry better than their teammates. Neither of them are, like, great pass catchers. Both of them might be okay there. How can I justify putting a guy who did that at the FCS level over a guy who did that, you know, at, you know, not a huge school, but at BYU? That's a legitimate program. They finished, like, 19th in the country country last year, you have to take Tyler Algier over Julius Chestnut and, you know, over a lot of these other dudes who are the good peer runners in this class, but haven't been as good as Tyler Algier. And the third number to keep in mind for him is 27 tackles. He played linebacker early on in his career after walking on at BYU. He was not like a recruited guy. And so given that utility that he has, you know, he's a good athlete. He's a big dude. He's got that dog in him from playing defense, playing on special teams. He offers this like ancillary utility to teams where like if it gets down to final cuts and you got to cut, you know, Tyler Algier or I don't know, Isaiah Pacheco. Isaiah Pacheco doesn't have utility on special teams and defense. At least he hasn't proven that in college. Tyler Algier has. So I'm, I'm taking Tyler Algier if I'm a GM in that situation. Get him in the door. He's going to prove his worth to a team. Uh, my high-end comp for him is Jay Ajayi. Big dude. Good at Boise State. Really good stretch of games with the Dolphins. Was solid with the Eagles. And the low-end comp for Tyler Algier is Alex Barnes, who you know, was similarly productive at Kansas State. You know, med pass catcher, athletic dude, never quite put it together in the NFL, has just not really been anything, been pretty disappointing. So fairly wide range of outcomes. I think Tyler Algier is a good player for sure. My RB6 in this class is Keonta Ingram out of USC, um, formerly out of Texas. The first number to keep in mind for him is 161.6% box-adjusted efficiency rating in his final season at USC. 
that's higher than the box adjusted efficiency ratings posted by every running back drafted in the first or second round in the last three years. And it's behind only Brees Hall and Tyler Algier among players in this class. He's a good runner. He's an efficient runner. And the second number for him is 89 receptions. And I said before when I was talking about, I think, Letty Brown, Keonta Ingram, that's number one in this class among FBS players who are at least 210 pounds. So he checks the boxes of like workhorse size, level of competition, three down ability. And he's athletic, 4'5", 3 in the 40, 6 foot, 221 pounds. I don't know what that speed score is, but it's a good one. The third number for him, though, is a 33.5 volatility rating, which kind of describes the relationship between a player's box-adjusted efficiency rating and his relative success rate. And a high Bay rating, low success rate, means you're a pretty volatile runner on a, on a down-to-down basis, despite being efficient overall. That's been Ingram throughout his career. That's the fifth highest volatility rating in this class, but it's also kind of weird because he's not good in the open field. His breakaway conversion rate, just 18th percentile, and so he's somehow efficient despite not being consistent while also not being a big play guy. And so, you know, he was a little bit better in that department as a senior this last year, but, you know, early on at Texas, really volatile. I think he's a good runner. There's a little bit of a risk that he's like an unpolished runner, a little bit of a raw runner. But my high-end comp for him is Kareem Hunt. I think he's right in that kind of family tree of like David Montgomery, Kareem Hunt type runners who break a decent amount of tackles, can contribute on all three downs, big dudes with decent athleticism. The low end for that is Royce Freeman. Guy, you know, just never quite was able to, you know, make good on a seemingly good prospect profile. Keonta Ingram could very well fall into that, or he could, you know, be one of these third, fourth round picks who ends up like Kareem Hunt and is just a stud in fantasy. I could definitely see either of those. Uh, My RB5 in this class is Kevin Harris out of South Carolina. I think he was my RB2 uh, pre-combine. The first number for him is 45.8%. That was his dominator rating as a true sophomore in the SEC. He had 1,300 yards, 16 touchdowns that year. That's the best sophomore dominator rating in the SEC in at least the last 15 years. Like, he was just incredible as a young player in the best conference in the country. And the second number to keep in mind for him is 10.7% relative success rate in 2021. And I specifically reference his 2021 number because he had back surgery prior to the season. He was incredible as a sophomore. 2021 was his junior season. He was less efficient overall, but that relative success rate number indicates that he has these good instincts. He's still a good runner, despite having been like a little bit slowed by his recovery from this injury this last season. He was still really good from just like churning out positive yards, you know, not taking negative plays, things like that. That relative success rate is in the 94th percentile while he was recovering from back surgery. He only had an 8th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating last year. So he wasn't good at like, you know, making big plays, being efficient overall, but I think he's got good instincts. And if you look at his box adjusted efficiency ratings from prior seasons, above the 90th percentile in 2020, above the 85th percentile in 2019, he's consistently been a dynamic, explosive, efficient runner other than the season in which he was recovering from back surgery. And during that season, he was still a very consistent runner at churning out positive yardage, given the situations he was carrying the ball in, given the box counts he was seeing relative to really talented teammates. The third number I have for him is 79.5% true catch rate. That's the lowest in this class. He has some decent receptions totals. I don't think he is currently capable of contributing on third down in the NFL. It's almost a certainty that whatever team he lands on will have better options as pass catchers. He's not a three down back. He was my RB2 going into the combine. He ran like a 4-6, I think is what is the verified 40 time we have. He was explosive in the jumps and just kind of like thinking about these other players more. I, I can't justify putting Kevin Harris above some of Brees Hall, obviously. Um, Kenneth Walker answered some of the size concerns. I moved him above Kevin Harris. And these next two guys that I have above him are just three down backs. And I can't justify putting Kevin Harris above, you know, a couple guys who were also efficient, but were three down backs. High end comp for him is Sean Green. Played for the Jets about 10 years ago. Had a couple thousand yard seasons. Big dude, good runner. And then the low end comp is Divino Zigbo. Another really efficient college runner who was, you know, explosive efficient in college and just hasn't been anything in the NFL. I think the risk for Kevin Harris is that he's just not healthy. This back surgery kind of ruined him. That's the risk. He could be nothing. He could be a thousand yard rusher. I think, I think that's the upside for him. My RB4 is Rashad White 
out of Arizona State. And the first number to keep in mind for him is 18.9%. That was his target share, 97th percentile. I believe it's the highest in the class. The other guy who might be close is Tyler Beatty, but I think Rashad White's is higher. And just like James Cook, he was also used dynamically. He was split out wider in the slot almost 16% of the time, 82nd percentile. And on those targets, he had a, an 88% catch rate, averaged 10.5 yards per target. Those are 89th and 90th percentile numbers. He's just a good receiver. And he's, you know, 215 pounds. He's a big dude. He can play on all three downs. And he was an efficient runner. The second number to keep in mind for him is 131%. That's his box adjusted efficiency rating in the 82nd percentile. So, you know, explosive, efficient overall. But, you know, just like some of these other guys, the third number to keep in mind for him is his relative success rate number, which is only in the 41st percentile. And so there's a risk here that he's just a raw runner using his athleticism. You know, he ran 448 in the 40. 87th percentile burst score using these athletic traits to like create big plays and run efficiently overall despite not doing you know maybe the nuance like little things well on a down-to-down basis that allows him to consistently churn out positive yardage I don't know that he has that ability and so the comps I have for him are David Johnson on the high end who I think very similar to Rashad White who's like a workhorse sized dude he's bigger than White but you know they both have requisite size workhorse sized dude athletic, explosive, who succeeded as a three-down back while being a little bit more athlete than runner. I think that's true of David Johnson. He was never, you know, Le'Veon Bell. He was never Zeke Elliott, you know, really, you know, nuanced, not a great pure runner and, you know, was successful despite that because of his athletic traits. I think Rashad White could be that guy. Another guy who's like that but hasn't been as successful is like Kenyon Drake. Uh, Tony Pollard is another guy like this. And I think Rashad White could be that type of player. I think that's probably a more likely outcome for him than, than David Johnson. But... I think that represents a pretty good range of outcomes for him. I think he's going to be a successful player either way. My RB3 is Damian Pierce, who I have moved up a lot since the last time I put together rankings. And I think that's really just because the numbers tell me he's one of the best runners in this class. And maybe outside of James Cook, the best receiver in this class, despite low volume. The first number to keep in mind for him is 1.7, which is his average depth of target, 74th percentile, third highest in this class. And despite those advanced targets, he had an 88.2% catch rate, which is the fifth highest in this class and is in the 91st percentile. So he's being targeted further downfield than almost anybody in this class and is also catching a higher percentage of his passes than almost anybody in this class. That's pretty damn good. That's a good combo. (laughs) And the second number to keep in mind for him is 18.7% final season relative success rate. That would be the highest number among all running backs taken in the first two rounds in the last three drafts. It's That's just an incredible number. He's succeeding on his carries on almost 20% more of his attempts than the other dudes at Florida. And the other dudes at Florida are like good runners. They're like, that's a big program. Those are highly touted, highly recruited guys that he's just smashing on a play-to-play basis. And even his career mark in relative success rate, 9.8% is in the 93rd percentile. So he's been elite over his career. His final season was almost twice as good as his career number, even though his career number is in the 93rd percentile. He was just absolutely un- like otherworldly good last year on a per-touch basis. And he's not a big play guy either, but his box-adjusted efficiency rating, like overall efficiency relative to these really good teammates at Florida, still in the 57th percentile. So he's just one of the best pure runners in this class while also offering three-down ability that might be more dynamic than than everybody in this class outside of James Cook. The third number to keep in mind for him is he averaged only 10.3 touches per game in his most heavily used season in college in 2020. The sample we have for him of touches, targets, receptions, rushes, all that stuff is just so low for a guy who is so good on a per touch basis. And this has become almost like a meme. Like everybody knows Damian Pierce was lightly used in college. Everybody knows he should be a better pro than he was a college player, given that he was criminally underused in college. I'm pretty willing to just overlook his small role in college because he was just so damn good. And the high end comp for him I have is Eddie Lacy. And Eddie Lacy's also a joke at this point, but like early on in his career at Green Bay, he was an RB1 level dude. He was a big guy. Damian Pierce is also a big guy. A uh, good receiver, Eddie Lacy. Good runner, like really nimble for, for a big guy. Um, similarly athletic as Damian Pierce. Neither of them are like elite athletes. Both of them, I think, are like light on their feet um, given their size. Damian Pierce could be that kind of dude. And I've, I've been struggling to come up with like a, a low end comp for him given that he just doesn't have weaknesses to his game outside of not being like an explosive athlete. And I can't think of any guys who have been like 
unsuccessful while offering the kind of like high level three down utility he offers. I ended up going with Mike Gillisley because Mike Gillisley was just so efficient in like a part-time role in Buffalo for a couple years. But I don't think Mike Gillisley is the kind of receiver Damian Pierce was. And I'm struggling to find a guy who really matches Damian Pierce's skill set while not being a successful player. So Mike Gillisley is my low end comp. I don't think it's a good comp. My RB2 in this class is Kenneth Walker out of Michigan State. Uh, the first number to keep in mind for him, I couldn't even pick one. Um, so I just went with four different numbers, and they all are reflective of his ability as an elite pure runner. 146% box adjusted efficiency rating. That's 90th percentile. 9.3% relative success rate. 90th percentile. 40.2% breakaway conversion rate. 89th percentile. 0.33 missed tackles forced per attempt. 98th percentile. He's just an absolutely elite pure runner. And then, you know, I, I just came, came out with a video diving deep into Kenneth Walker like a couple weeks ago. So I, I won't linger on this very long. But the second number for him is his true catch rate number, 85.7%. Number 30 out of 30 at running backs in this class. You know, he only has 19 receptions to his name, 15th percentile target share. He just hasn't been a good receiver in college, hasn't been heavily used, wasn't good when he was used. Um, if you're more interested in this argument, if you think I'm missing things, go watch the video I put out on him a couple weeks ago, dove into all of it. I don't think it's likely that he is a decent receiver even in the NFL. The third number for him is 211 pounds, which is undersized, but I think it's just big enough that even given his inability or relative lack of ability to contribute on third downs, I think 211 pounds is just big enough for be for him to be a high volume two down runner. Proportionally, you know, he's, he's just over 5'9", and at 211 pounds, that means he's proportionally built like guys like Alvin Kamara, Marshawn Lynch, Noshawn Moreno, Chris Carson. Those guys are bigger than him, but proportionally, they're, the, they're very similar, and so I think I'm in on Kenneth Walker as my RB2. High-end comp for him is Julius Jones, who, you know, played for Dallas 15 years ago, was really good despite dealing with injuries. And the low-end comp for Kenneth Walker is Ronald Jones, who was kind of like Kenneth Walker, was an athletic dude, undersized, really good in college as a runner, really productive, did not contribute as a receiver, and has been held back in the NFL because of that, despite being good on a per-touch basis on the ground. And so Kenneth Walker could fall, you know, victim to that same sort of thing, where he's a good runner, but just never quite puts it together because he's not a good pass catcher. So that's the risk for him. And my number one running back in the 2022 class is Brees Hall, easy choice. The first number for him is 44%. That's his dominator rating, 91st percentile, incredibly productive. The second number for him is 116.9. That's his 97th percentile speed score. He ran a 439 at 5'11", 217 pounds. Like we all know the boxes that he checks. A requisite amount of, of receptions. He's fast. He's big. He was productive. He was efficient overall. But the third number I want to keep in mind for him, I also made a Brees Hall video a couple weeks ago that kind of d dives into this more. 1.2% relative success rate, which is better than the other guys at Iowa State, but is only in the 43rd percentile. And among running backs drafted in the first or second round in the last three years, that relative success rate would rank eighth out of 12 guys. It's just not very good relative to other like high-end running back prospects. And Brees Hall has been efficient overall because he's a good big play runner. He's athletic. He's explosive. He's dynamic in the open field. 80th percentile breakaway conversion rate, 72nd percentile box adjusted efficiency rating. Just like, who was it before? Keontae Ingram, Bryant Kobach. I think he might have a little bit of an issue being like, a highly nuanced runner on a play-to-play -play basis, like consistently churning out positive yardage. I know, uh, you know, who's, who's kind of spoken to this is, uh, Graham Barfield, um, in his yards created has indicated that, like Brees Hall is leaving a lot of yards on the field despite being dynamic overall. So like these numbers are backed up by, you know, charted film study from like a really respected analyst. I'm not out on an island here. Like Brees Hall is leaving yards on the field, even though he's a super explosive athlete. And I think he's good despite that. I think he's, you know, he's my RB1. Um, and the high-end comp I have for him is Amon Green. You know, Packers running back from a couple years ago, a couple years ago, like 15, 20 years ago at this point. I was a kid. But really fast, decent receiver, straight line speed, really explosive, really good running back. I think he also was a little bit boom bust, um, but that that's how successful a guy like this can be. The, the bottom end for Brees Hall, I think, is Cam Akers, who has been similarly boom bust in the NFL, you know, even ignoring this last year where he, you know, was kind of hampered coming back from the Achilles injury. Prior to that, he was efficient, but incredibly boom bust, incredibly volatile on a per touch basis. But Cam Akers is still a good player. Like he's, you know, athletic. He can contribute on all three downs, despite maybe not being like an elite receiver. He has that three down ability. The, you know, the floor for, for Brees Hall is very high. 
I think people are a little bit too bought in on him being like this elite Jonathan Taylor level prospect. I think he's not that. And because of that, my advice would be to sell the 101 for like, you know, a big time package. But Brees Hall is easily the RB1 in this class. He's a near elite prospect. He checks a lot of boxes. So those are my rankings. These are pre-draft rankings. These are not how I would take players, you know, in order in a rookie draft. It's just how good do I think they are. Like Brian Robinson is like my RB22. He's obviously going to, you know, need to take him higher in a rookie draft given the draft capital he's likely to have. So, but that's what I got. Let me know in the comments how stupid I am um, for having Zamir White outside of the top 10. Isaiah Spiller also not in the top 10. Let me know how big of a fucking idiot I am. But uh, yeah, excited for the draft. I think tomorrow, um, this will come out on Wednesday. So yeah, thanks for sticking around. Hit the like button and the subscribe button. Catch me on Twitter and have a great Wednesday. Peace.